Well, they wanted to jump out today. Not a good sign, folks. We got to do better than this. Got a couple of insights uh, here last this last week. Looking at stuff. Thank you for being out there and posting all your things that you do. Gives me an insight on what's uh, going on in uh, part of the problem that we have in the so-called social media and the way we communicate today. Which actually, as I look more and more, it's as we all know, it's being controlled, and we're not taking the proper steps to prepare for it, make alternatives that are work, and that's going to be again something that's coming and attacking you. If it prevails against you, it's that's your problem, isn't it? And that's not my rule, and this kind of pretends the whole world that we live in it wasn't so perfect. Uh, before I go on, but BTW, this will be BTW RLM 348, because I start to get lost in my <laughs> thoughts already. So much to say, so much to do, so little time to say it, and so little life in trying to deal with it, especially when you're not very many trying to, or you focus, is what I see, lots of our focus is on the potentially the wrong things, I suppose. This uh, first story has been actually a tab that's been up for a while. It's an ongoing saga, but I think this title is important because I can easily, yes, Vince, uh, extend it out uh, beyond pretty quickly uh, that describes our lives around the world and really controlled by a few people. You notice uh, maybe this is not a, some people like to hear uh, certain words used all the time, and I don't do that. I don't identify people by titles because I don't know what to call this thing. I don't know what to really, it's beyond all the titles that man uses for the harm that's being done to us. That I can't, I, I can't put a title on it. It's an effect, and it has a cause. Whatever that name is, and I address those things. I look at the effect, and then I go try to find out what the cause, the actual cause is. And that can be very difficult. And then other times it's not so difficult, and which is... That's the things that on the surface of what I look at is so we can't even recognize the stuff that's easy to get to, let alone really get to the deep, the deeper thing. So this title, Dying Inside, was the first part, in which I, that's kind of interesting generally when you think about it across the broad spectrum. Dying Inside, you can say what? Well, we take it personal, we can take it societal, we can take it in lots of areas, spiritually. And we see this world has kind of gone nuts. It's lost its, lost its way. And so it did it. We didn't necessarily. And that's part of what this matter is, is that we have to hold down the fort, if you will, for ourselves. We lay our own foundation. And there's going to be attacks against that at every turn. And this is not something of, uh, that we just take a position and uh, we know it because of arrogance. We, we, make, we build a foundation for why we exist and we have a position. And it's just not... Not because it's there's a reason just because we say it and because it's we there's a reason for it. And the reason why we have to do that because the way the condition is any any philosophy becomes any idea any notion becomes the next rule without a constraint. And I talk to you from these constraints. The constraints are our prior antecedent rights before the imposition of this nonsense that we see in the world. And that we take the nonsense as, as an in evidence, it's almost self-evident of, of the problem and what the problem is. It's really not that it's not understood. It's that a lot of people were missing on how to respond to it. And I put it that way because I don't know really what the right response would be relative to all the ways we're being attacked. As a people, that most of us that I know of just want to be left alone. We don't We don't want the government to be the brute that it's become. And it wasn't supposed to at least in the United States of America, at least by what the promotion was, and now as I see it, at least by what the property and land laws were to do in order to cause that to be peaceful. In other words, the sheriff is to keep the peace, not disturb it himself. And, and anyway, so we can go on and on about the Dying inside was the title here. Assange's life is threatened by British state's legal deception. This is not necessarily just about Assange, although he's the, the actor here, and I don't really know where to place this guy. I told you he's either a player or he is an ignorant dupe. Uh, I can't now see either he's anywhere anywhere else. 
that this state's legal deception by the article was limited by the article to a judge. Identifying all the inhumaneness of the British system, notwithstanding it sees, that inhumanity, if you I use the word inhuman, inhumanity sees the United States system as inhumane by, by so-called judicial decree. And so this, if you want to start getting into the caucusocracy and getting into the stinking abyss, we're looking at it right here. And it's not about Assange. This is about a deception within the perception within people trying to expose the, the problem. The state's legal deception doesn't end with the judge. It doesn't end with the procedures. It envelops the entirety of the system itself. And that the same deception can be found just about everywhere you see what they call the rule of law, rule of law, and democracy. It also kind of bleeds into direct democracy, which is accepted by the UN. So you know, they need to make these tangibilities, these connectabilities up for everybody. So you think it's all viable. But dying inside, the, we're, societies are dying inside uh, because of a state's legal deception, is one of the deceptions. It's not just a judge making wrong decisions. It's the system itself, and everyone in it is the deception under color that it's doing some benefits for everybody. And because of that, and because there's no one learning how and or actually throwing it off more than complaining, for the most part, there are things being done, but it just seems so small and far in between, that we're, as a society, we're dying inside. And one of the continuing themes is has been, and particularly today, is that things are changing. In change, in flux, if you will, they're changing, and we're whoever is at the hands uh, have has had the hands on that tiller, for those ships of state, whatever ones are floating, will make the direction and destination what they have planned. We uh, people generally have been put on the in the hold, and we don't we complain about it, but we won't figure out what we need to do, and maybe you know the idea is maybe we need to bore some holes in the hull. And uh, maybe we need to sacrifice some some people, I guess, and or you know, create a problem that if we have a better plan, we can create the, the the dilemma for the ship of state and its problems in its hull, and we can escape while they're dealing with it. I, I don't know. My thought is to do that. You start making things that are not detrimental to you, uh, that are not detrimental and jeopardizing you, that cause trouble for the uh, maneuverers of the ship ship of ships of state that are causing this problem for everybody the fact that you're in the hold at all. Even though you clamor you clamor to be free and in peace. And then you see notice it around it's insanity and there's no peace. And part of that is this a, another thing about accountability. And that's where people start getting another rub. They don't want to rely on any so called law. We put that in quotes, which was really the problem of accountability. If you start denying that you have no objective basis, I keep telling you, there's no objective basis. And that objective basis is what's used against you every day by the same people that are you call our tyrants. And yet you, we don't see that as well. But dying inside, Assange's life is threatened by the British state's legal deception. There's a legal deception. It's not in this story just the judge. But this title calls my attention to the legal deception across the globe. And we, you hear me talk about it over and over again. It's not periodic, it's over and over again. In, in 2013, we sued the Bar Association. They failed to answer. They failed to answer upon the charge and, and the proof we had, had in the, built into the claim, into the into the lawsuit, an equity lawsuit. In other words, we weren't asking for damages. We we're saying you've got to stop this essentially treason against the United States and the laws of the United States and the people of the United States and their government and their treasuries. And they didn't answer to that, which underneath their own legal system is a, a default judgment against them. And so we look deeper into this problem with Julian Assange's life is threatened. It is. That's not, I'm not talking that it's not. Uh, I've told you he, he's not being, he's been deprived of due process. Apparently the Queen agrees with all this as well, which is what a Twitter I put out relative to focusing on Epstein and help. But Prince, An, Prince uh, Quix Andrew is presumed innocent even so, folks, until there's that conviction. But the Queen throws her own son out of the Buckingham Palace, shows you she doesn't care about the presumption of innocence. She doesn't care about justice. And this is another high player 
Uh, if I get high, I don't know if she smokes or not, but at any rate, it doesn't matter. I don't know where people put this, but it's indicative of a problem. You know them when you see them. always comes to my mind now, since I now have objective pr proof, if you will, if a statement acknowledged internationally in the Libra Code, Article 1, exactly in paraphrase, you know them when you see them. And so why this is a continuing question throughout these years and decades I've been doing, the, you know, making this information out, and why people still don't get it enough to go figure out what to do, is really an, a, fascin it's a fascination on one level, and it's just a, you know, a complete disappointment on the other. And I don't even know more adjectives, because it gets, uh, what does it get? It's just adjectives, you can take them as you want them. It's not us fulfilling our what we need. It's someone else imposing upon us to fill their needs, and then that defines our abuse that we see through the Epstein issue. And I'm not getting into Epstein. I'm pointing out this legal deception is protecting all of that. We perceive a legality of things that's improper upon us. The entire thing is a deception, not just the way this story pops out and not just the British system. The British system has players inside. And they all, you look, and they all focus into certain areas. And I, I, had, I was, you know, again, my mind goes, up, my mind already knows where to say to talk to you. I don't like going over into those places because then a lot of you will glom onto it and you focus on that as the, as the thing, and it's, it's, it's not the thing you can defeat anyway. We almost can only eat at it from the sides at this point. We almost can only protect ourselves in uh, very narrow areas be, because the occupation is that pervasive. So dying inside, we're all dying inside, and I see societally, through our functionaries, through the instrumentalities, they're all failing right before our eyes. We're really not taking the proper action. We take the, we actually do the improper action, which I find another fascination. In fact, I, without getting too far afield, I saw some things going on in some videos. I think over at Sound Minds, he's got them posted. A bunch of folks, you know, they're passionate. But the admission was they knew what they were doing was not, was not, was of against the law. And I, I'm told you don't do stuff that, that gives the other side the discretion, and then don't insult the guy, the one who has the discretion, that he has it. This is a complete disconnect from reality and the fact that you need to keep away from jeopardy. There's other things you get to do. Do those. Do those things that are not put in jeopardy. If the system asks you to fill out a complaint form a certain particular way and you don't have full information, do fill it out that way. Don't get yourself in trouble. I don't say you commit, you're not committing to that. You're actually, when you understand what I'm telling you, you s use that to set them up. It takes a couple more steps. You're not a gunslinger walking in and, and, and doing, doing, you know, the baddest gunslinger in the world. And when you get done, you're standing there alive. No, this is a, there's a gang out there. And you, we have to deal with that. This gang is organized to levels that I, I don't even know if I appreciate. I just kind of see the evidence of it, and I can kind of track down that way. Dying inside. I don't want to focus on this, but we are dying inside. We've died inside spiritually, physically, legally, lawfully, and uh, we do the wrong things. And I'm not, there's no blame here. It's just that we do. It's the part of our nature that's been exploited. And so this view, the British state's legal deception is not what this article says. It's actually the entirety of the legal deception. In every place, the rule of law and democracy runs. And you can look at Assange's treatment as your treatment, even though you're not feeling it at this point. Those of you that get involved, you, you complain about the fact that there, there's brutality and this and that, but I, I don't see that you do much to evade it. One of those issues where you got yourself in trouble, I didn't see a group of people that were sit back so they wouldn't get in trouble that had paperwork to file to make this a, an issue the attack and retaliation becomes an issue that you actually address. I saw a lot of people leaving. I saw a lot of people not agreeing that they did wrong or that they would uh, wait to see what the what the harm was. My mind's going, why didn't you have a habeas corpus fly in there? Why didn't they have one in their pockets? Why didn't everyone have one without names so they can put it on their behalf? Why didn't they do it in a, an equitable action when the prosecutor stopped taking phone calls or whatever because they would just do that? And you knew that. Why didn't you set up with an, a, a counteraction against those charges and, the, and just file them with the court? Make a dust-up over it. Not just a frivolous one either. 
and I don't want to get lost again. I get my mind just starts going off on this stuff. I hear, I see all this opportunity that's wasted. If you're trying to change this cockistocracy that's risen up against this and this occupation, as I identify it, which puts you in a very minimal place of rights, so why would you go do anything? First of all, that brought you in, and then in Assange's case, he got picked up. He, he we all know the story. And then why did he not? assert the things that at least I've told you and I know, whether you all know it or not, why didn't he assert the obligations he had to make a record of this deception of justice, this deception that they're doing it, uh, that they're doing it correctly? Why didn't he make meet his burdens? That's a, a different side of a similar condition where I say don't put yourself in jeopardy. Why do you put yourself in jeopardy without a a remedy or a record to be made to out the condition that you're in. Why don't you think about that ahead of time? This attack on journalism is an attack, whether or not I, Assange is a player or a uh, an ignorant dupe, and until I see different, I have to go, those are the two channels I'm going to adjust to until I see different. Then we do have a serious problem with the First Amendment and an attack against it in getting reports and getting the truth, or those that profess to be the truth, or those that you've seen create the truth, in what we call journalism today, and those journalism journalists that cause a trouble, and who they speak out against, and how they get beat down, shows you who, who may be in control. Another proof, you know someone when you see them. U.S. government drops case against Max Blumenthal after jailing journalists on false charges. These people are don't even do this slick anymore. It just brute force. They attacked Blumenthal, another journalist, who uh, my my interpretation of his reports is pretty straight up. He he comes at this thing pretty straight up. Uh, He said some things about some people that someone didn't like. And they set him up on charges. They arrest him. They make his life, life miserable. And now his charges are being dropped by the United States government. And so we get the, when I said before, in Assange and the legal deception, it's in the United States. We all know this. But do you take that as a lead to say, okay, what, if I'm in these areas, if I'm potentially going to be in these areas of, of, of attack, have I put my mind toward how I'm going to rem- make it a dust, how I'm going to make a, a point about this? Have I really thought about how that would work? How I'm going to hold back when I am, where I am, when I'm going to file, what I'm going to file to defend myself and expose the bigger deception? Or do I just not do anything and let it continue? Our life has gotten a bit complicated in that regard. Sorry, I was just talking with the, because I don't talk much. I mean, get in once a, <laughs> once a week into the RLM chat. Or maybe once last night for a few hours, and then and again when I show up, and I don't really communicate in there. I'm too busy doing the broadcast, talking with Grimner through the chat. Really difficult to do. He's you know doing the trivia before about this new thing with uh, what the YouTube. Maybe I'll get to that. These are potential attack points, vulnerabilities. No, no different than you find in the internet uh, digitally. And you, I tend to look at the potential, prepare for the potential, then I'm settled with it, and I move on. Because I found out if you don't, and it comes at you, well, first of all, you get a better comprehensive view of what's going on in the beginning, and then you can just let it rest. And it's not a surprise. When it comes at you, then you're at least partly prepared. And, and, and so to move on here. So journalism is under attack. First Amendment rights is under attack. And I keep thinking about you auditors out there. I, don't, I wish you'd do a little different, but that's okay. You do what inspires you. There's different. There's better things you could be doing with what you think you're doing. I mean, I'm looking at these. Is that the best thing you can do? Get arrested for? I guess the. Oh, it was about chalk. That's right, chalk on the sidewalk. Is that the best example you can create for yourself to put it in their hands? Discretion to the government? That's just not smart to my mind. Do do something better. I mean, and if you're going to do that and you're going to make a point about that, get ready to start engaging the system. Otherwise, you they handle you. They deal with you. And anyway, so journalism, First Amendment rights, free speech, all this stuff. And there's a whole bunch more than just free speech in the press in the First Amendment. And that's not the limit of it, but that's what they, that you're confined to. Because you haven't figured out that that's the point and that's the, that's the control. And so journalism is under attack. Why? Well, uh, at this point, I haven't heard more of Max Blumenthal's discussion about this. To make it more public is a problem for me. The guy seems to have a 
a point to be said. Maybe he will now that they've dropped the charges. That's one of the points where you say, do I fight quite yet? Or do I wait till the, that clears itself up and when they do drop the charges, and then I go after their throat, whatever throat they have available? Do I chop their knees off now? And are we prepared for that as a people? This is a reality. This is not something I'm asking anybody to make up. So those of you in this realm, and a lot of people on the Internet might be more vulnerable than they think on this, and also depend on, on who you are and how much you get out to and uh, anything, uh, whatever, whoever you might insult. Again, whoever is insulted makes up the story that you're going to have to defend. And so if you find out the subject matter that you may be vulnerable to and you find the pathway within the objective basis they'll have to come by, the narrow path, you'll likely be able to protect yourself and then make a turnaround with it later, if it ever hits you. And it, somehow I'd say this, and I know maybe you're thinking that's a burden. To me, knowing that has become, I'll just tell you, it's become a, it frees you up. Uh, getting over to the, no, boy, off, off a point here, uh, the Forest Service coming after us on our mining claim, once I understood the dynamic of the law, how that worked, the objective basis by which both of us, uh, them and us, would head to deal, and I found out the limitation of their authority, and I found our power within the land, the law of, of the land, it became a freeing condition. Yes, it was a, I had to learn a little bit, but, and it took a bit to write a paper, 20, I told you the 21 pages, I'm talking to you about stuff I've talked to you before. When I came to the realization of the 21 pages, and it sounds like a lot of work, but you're talking about the government coming against you. And this is not some monkey gorilla you want on you. And so I took it, on, I didn't want that on my back, so we write, I did the study it took, came up with 21 pages of evidence of fact and law that showed that they were completely criminal in what they did. Once I did that and understood it, from that day, and this is years and years ago, I don't even know what year it was, the 2009, I don't even put a second thought to it. I already know I've laid the foundation. If they ever try to come back at us, I've got them. I've got them to the extent I've got them. And uh, the way I've got them, the way I feel i got them, it's going to, if it doesn't do justice, it's going to open up that can of whoop-ass of embarrassment about how they were never doing it right to begin with. And I ask you to put yourself in that same place before you go do anything to limit the jeopardy as well. So they're after your First Amendment rights. These two examples, Assange or Max Blumenthal, whatever uh, the reality of their persona is and what they do and what they don't do, I don't know. But this is a notice to you. They're attacking your First Amendments. All of you that want to protect First Amendments, and that's the only place you are, expect to be attacked. If you don't have more than Assange, expect to be treated inhumanely. If you only have what they had on Blumenthal, expect to be mistreated. I'm not looking at any remedy there, am I, though? I'm hoping Max kind of steps up. I don't know Max. Never talked to him. Don't know anything about him. I hope he steps up on the false arrest. That uh, has been uh, fallen away as a big thing. That's a big thing to have an innocent man or woman taken up and then not charged. That's one of the tools that they use anymore. And what they do there is they take you out of commission as well. Again, that's a violation of your of continuing right to do what you did. No different than they did in a mining claim. They interfered with our work. That's a, a right that we were granted to do. And when we have to engage them on things that they don't, there's no warrant to, to do against us, they're also taking our production time. Not just the fact we have the right to work, but they're taking our production value. And so this is a domino effect of harm that I don't think people think too much about. You think on the surface, but you don't realize that there's reasons why they're not supposed to do what they do. And when they do and you don't bring accountability, they do... It's a trail of harm, a lineage of harm that continues more and beyond the initial harm that people don't step up and protect themselves against. So, I, I, again, we're dying inside. we got people being attacked in your First Amendment, uh, left and right. They're doing it by the governments themselves are doing it. Whatever you thought they were, whatever you thought the, the objective basis was, the, the inside the caucusocracy has been run by the worst of the worst running their own agendas if the Epstein thing didn't point that out to you in spades. So the, the other thing, giving the mining and this and that and the concepting of the United States government being, um, you know, we call it sovereign. And I told you within its obligations and grants and duties, it's not sovereign. 
it's actually fulfilling law to the people. Why the mining law and any grant law, even the Homestead Act that it used to exist in the United States, is so powerful to example that to us. There is a limit to government. And so we tend to miss these little cues in the news. I want to point this part out. This brings up another aspect, because one of the attacks is the economic attack. We know Agenda 2030, as I've read it to you and explained it to you, when you get down far enough, you read it's about what they call credit is debt, and it's about you being in sustainable debt forever. Now, before once your egg is fertilized and then they replant you in the mother's womb, taking away her property and rights, whatever that is, all the way to the death and beyond, because they tax you after death. Remember, unless you set yourself in the legal parameters where you don't own anything, which is part of the secret here. You don't identify as the thing that they're subject, and you have nothing that they have become subject to. And then all of a sudden, now that problem disappears. I don't understand why people don't get that. But uh, we see inside a problem in the world evidence of reality and what we should be focusing on ourselves. You think yourselves to be authority and be free and, and be able to determine your life. That's another term for being a sovereign. I don't mean sovereign citizen. Let's understand that problem. Just the idea that you have freed a will uh, to decide, again, to the limit of someone else's uh, rights and whatever all that turns out to be. We see evidence of where we actually should be and the complaint that a criminal who can't steal from you makes. In this story, Massive Leak confirms Turkey's gold for gas scheme to evade U.S. sanctions on Iran. Now, I looked at gold for gas, and I said, well, what, again, no different than the United States of Britain stopping that Syrian-bound, or, or, or allegedly Syrian-bound oil tanker in Gibraltar. What claim can the EU, Britain, the United States, or any other country put on a sovereign nation's wealth in minerals? In this case, we have gas. That's their product, product of the oil and gas. For gold, what sanctions can the United States actually claim against sovereign nations dealing in their own resources between themselves? And you notice this is not using the Federal Reserve note. Shows you now where the United States is willing to go, where all these uh, rule of law countries are willing to go, notwithstanding they have actual no, no authority. Which shows you, again, you know them when you see them. This is what you're up against. If you're not and you just and this is not just a complaint oh look what you're up against this is this is who you're up against and now you have to figure out how do i defeat that well this was a, a rem, this was trying to get around the uh, turkey and uh, they recognize they have a problem there's a reality in the world the, the world does work on the frn the petrodollar right there's lots of countries that have figured out that they can now move themselves away from it they're getting back to their sovereign power, working with each other on their own terms, in their own currencies, or their own uh, clearing houses, whatever you want to call them. They're still the major connections, but I've been asking you all where you can start pulling away and start engaging in things that don't bring you underneath the scrutiny. So as soon as somebody like the United States attacks Turkey and Iran for dealing in their minerals, you can be outed for a war criminal. That's what I'm saying you do to the government. You don't step yourself in the violation they have discretion over. You act where they have no discretion, and it's not and uh, not and it's lawful. Here we have two products of the soil, the mineral, being traded. And I, my take on this is not the not the whatever the story is about this, not whatever the geopolitics. This is the fact of the two sovereigns that you uh, must say anybody who has land is is that is this as well who produces from the land that's yours. And we see that the government wants to take that, which I told you there's a chasm if you understood the dynamic. It's not supposed to take, and it's a crime to take. It's a war crime to take. It's a violation of trust. It's a violation of the law when you understand exactly what I've been saying about how to tie it together. Massive leak confirms Turkey's gold for gas scheme. See, this is a prejudicial headline. The point is, is that there's two sovereigns using mineral wealth that they own as sovereigns that have nobody can say anything about. The United States tries. Shows you what kind of a, a an unlaw, a lawless entity the United States has come. And the people of the United States are blamed for that in some regard. Although, when you listen to the leaders of nations that understand, they know that you're just a bunch of dupes. In general. 
Now, the interesting state about this is this reminds us, this story says that money is gold. And I wanted, that's my whole focus on this whole thing and set up all that just to come. Folks, you're going to have to start learning to go back to the future relative to substantial things that are in production side. And we're going to have to get involved with the substance of that and not the fiat systems, whatever they offer. And I include blockchain as a fiat system. I include the Internet, the uh, which is now we'll see the, the thing coming on to us relative to uh, <laughs> to the uh, like YouTube problem, this COPPA thing. Uh, they're they're going to... They're going to make the internet like it's a one big porn site that you have to validate your age because you're all going to be treated the children, the wards of the state that you are if this goes in that direction and you let it. And it's built into the rules as I've been looking at COPPA right now because it came up also, I think, a while back. I think, again, Sound Minds has a little short video. It bothers me what people go off on. There's a sensationalism that's not written into the law. If you would just focus in on the law, you'd see where the real point is. And as I said, like climate change, if they get that wrong, they kill us all. Whatever the reason is, if they get that wrong, they kill us all. It's our environment. Same thing with all this. You get that wrong and you set yourself up for failure. And you don't set yourself up for protection, which I now I have to turn my mind to because I see that uh, I guess that's coming on. But it, it, it's, it's simply written in the black and white, the guidance that they gives you. And so uh, money is gold, folks. Uh, gold is money. This is not the FRN. They're dealing in totally in, uh, other other things than what the United States and the World Bank and the Bank of Settle uh, Settlements Bank and all that stuff is involved with. And yet the G United States government wants to stick its nose in, it, in someone or other sovereign's business of its own property it is an indication to you they're going to do it to you at home. And they do it to you at home. It's not even a question. How many of you start to build the record back up to show that's a crime and to start asserting pressure and power back to regain the rest and peace and remedy that the laws of the United States were to give us to keep that entity from doing exactly what it's evidencing it's doing to other sovereigns, those that it's not supposed to touch. But it only it touches because it has what? The gang to do it. The violent power to do it. And that is evidence of what? Not the rule of any law, not the law of the land. And so it's self-evident, and it's in this, re in this uh, article, we will have to move from the system that they've allowed and they continue to put on us and the digitization of that world, whatever they want to describe it as, and move back into more tangibility between us. And I'm not so sure we're able to anymore as a society. I see so much disconnection. I don't know, but let's move on. Uh, where the government also came to steal, and they did so successfully up until now and probably into the future, is uh, asset forfeiture. And it says the destruction of American liberty. But why? It's because of an attack by the so-called sovereign, this entity called the United States, and its subdivisions, as we see the CIA World Factbook, administrative subdivisions called states, are acknowledging they can use to come and steal your property. There's no sanctity in the property, and there hasn't been for a long time. I don't hear many people ad addressing this, and a lot of it's because the Bar Association sits in there and says you really can't do much, much, without, much without our members, any, either. No, that's not true, but that's what most people have gotten into, and that's then said, I put a paw on you stepping in and learning the simple stuff, like go read uh, for this uh, difference, COPPA, go C O P A P A. I don't know what the Child Privacy Protection Act, whatever. Go read it. It's not that hard. Yeah, it's a little bit inside out and complicated a bit when you start to try and get, pull the nuances out, but they're not that hard. It doesn't take any lawyer to actually see it. In fact, the lawyers that talk about it, in some parts, they don't even talk about it correctly. But then at the end of the video that I've seen, that they have a, a thing to sell. And so, I mean, you just got to discern, folks. You learn, read yourself. It's right there. And yeah, going on. I'll get to that point in a second. Asset forfeiture, destruction, liberty. Again, the American way... Uh, you know, America's not great again. You don't see th that. You don't see how property is being more protected anymore because also Trump is involved. No. They, in fact, they, stop, they fall short at every time. Everything we look at behind the scenes here, uh, what we do during the week is uh, show, we I can identify immediately where they fell short. They don't, nobody holds up to the property respect law part. And that's because none of you all really are putting there. You'd rather you'd rather just complain. Is all. I just want to put it there. You'd just rather complain. It's just not, it's just not going to work. And when I say go administrative, you're actually asserting the law against administrative. And I told you we've been pretty successful. When the case, even that we didn't fight, but we commented on within the administrative context, says 
that the agencies are doing it outside the jurisdiction and here's the parameters they were supposed to choose and a Supreme Court case comes down and pretty much addresses all that exactly the way you said it and they deny the, that to the power to the agencies now you know you're on point now you know that there's that objective basis and so we take a little bit of solace that it's there even though it's not being implemented in the first instance yet like Assange is not actually getting his due process neither is his attorneys, the bar members However, they're constructed, working with the United States, no less, to destroy even other people in other countries. They're all working together, notwithstanding the fact that those people are, are dis destroying the condition. You have an eyes to see when you do and ears to hear, which you should be today and any of the other time you listen behind a woodshed, to figure this pathway out to out them all. The failure to do that is, is how I draw, draw the line between Assange. I don't know. He's either an ignorant dupe or he's a player. There's, there's just no way else to get around that. The property of you and the property that you have relates to remedies, which is the, is the procedures in law. They reduce to due process. Somebody fabricated up how they would come after an inanimate object that was yours and steal it, and no one stepped up and said, but that's a color of, without warrant, actually, and that's extortion and coercion and conversion of my property when I'm not supposed to be involved. Guess who bring this, brought this up eventually? Well, we get a little link here, the history of asset forfeiture, the destruction of actual property when it can be mischaracterized to be in Congress, in commerce without remedy against that part as well. We see in Mises.org has a nice little discussion. Whose name but um, the next potential president of the United States, Biden? Now, I know, I know how far-fetched that is. I'm just pointing. These people, these cancers are around forever in our lives. They've been around forever doing the dastardly deeds and inside the, the system to destroy that so-called American liberty. And no one stops it. No one calls it out. Maybe till now we have the, maybe the internet. Uh, maybe till now we do. But you see how quickly that's controlled by those that are in the seats of decision, right? The owners. And nobody in the that's not in that mindset comes together to fortify I guess it would be a number of places that become reliable, but protected. You see, money can bribe anybody, it seems. And so there, no one comes up with a singular competition uh, to these these futures that they want, Facebook, Google, the, inter the, the Internet of Things, the art of so-called artificial intelligence, so-called going into quantum, so-called all this nonsense. It's all really just policy considerations made by profiteers who in various ways have subverted the condition, and everybody was crickets to it. So I have a link saw here on asset forfeiture. Who done it was really the people that are running for offices today to go to be president. They, they should be denounced right off the bat. Anybody who continues to support asset forfeiture, you should have a better word in your mouth, maybe more consistent what I say are the reasons behind the woodshed over time, I've told you, when we get to those things. And you start to assert that. It's possible. I was just looking at somebody who, uh, again, in this Internet of Things nonsense, is this uh, digital future that they want to throw onto you with the AI controls. Somebody in California brought up a, an initiative. They initiated, people initiated a condition to allow you to have data, uh, get your data, and, and stop them from selling it. Now, why, as I've said before, why don't you get people to step up and make those, those laws and those limitations? like Texas did against income tax. Well, why don't you do that for yourself? And I don't know about you all if you're not. I mean, I don't know I mean, how hard is that, actually, to come up with a formulation. In that regard, you could do that in every state. And so, I mean, anyway. I see, again, self-inflicted wounds on our complaints. And the, the complaint could have, as much energy could have been put into strategizing the action taken in order to counter it. Where does this lead? It leads the government to imposing upon the worst, uh, the people in the worst condition. Don't make things better so that they're not in the worst condition. No, beat down on the worst and understand the way 2008 came through with the restructuring of the econo economy. You're all potentially homeless already and don't know it. California plans forced in internment and asset seizure to solve homeless crisis. Again, theft. Government theft. Your property is not sacred anymore. 
they now deem you to be a load on society, and they create the problem. This is, I mean, my mind goes to Munchausen, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is your this your government. See, it's not your government. That's the whole point. That's what you complain about. But you don't take any steps to start to control this. There's millions of us, folks. Why do I have such a problem getting a hundred handful of people? And while well, I say it, those of you still listening, uh, this broadcast on uh, Minds.com, Cowboy Tech pointed out to me that uh, he boosted a one of my broadcasts, and I don't remember now what it was, uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And a lot of you are finding favor in it. Thank you for your time and your and your thumbs and up. And um, wish there was more comments. We could interact maybe a little bit. Thank you for that interaction. Thank you for finding favor in it. Uh, I'm asking us, and I think that was one of the one of the broadcasts where I'm saying we have something to do. Uh, here we have it again. It's every every week behind the woodshed. But minds.com. Thank you for participating and uh, and finding favor with thumbs up. Uh, I don't usually look at all that, but uh, there it was. So appreciate that no, and actually no thumbs down so all i can do is use that as a guide a guide to keep going keep explaining to you all maybe something will settle in doesn't have to be a grand thing but uh, something has to change if if you're not doing nothing then the other side that is doing something is is moving this against us now homeless uh, are going to be interned like they're in some war right like there's some enemy in a war right and this is established by the government itself this condition and it, it was a time when in the 90s when I was doing some study, homelessness was what status you wanted to show. What was interesting is after I started to describe that and write about it, when I was in, I was published and all this in other places, uh, the state started to go and realize, I think, that that status needed to be controlled. And the first indication about that was the law was changed to allow the D Department of Motor Vehicles to go find the homeless underneath bridges in order to establish so-called residence, the thing you need to to avoid. They realized there was a, that in the rules, I, uh, if, I mean, I don't know if I was the only one that found it, but I certainly did find it and write about it. If you found yourself to be non-resident, they couldn't attach to you. When I exposed it, well, that means you could just claim to live under a bridge, and if you were, then they could not address you. You were out legal. There's no jurisdiction. Next thing we know, they're writing letters. To, well, we can go investigate. If you say you live under a bridge, we're going to make that your residence. Shows you the limitation of the system and shows you the extension of the, of the crime they'll move against you and the status that they have to get in order to bring you into the fold and bring in the outlaw, like I've told you and explained to you before, but so that the outlaw doesn't destroy the system. The system they have is a usurpation and occupation. They don't want that destroyed. That's that's that that data acquisition and mitigation of the harms that the alternative dispute resolution works through to sell you down the river and their solutions to outcomes. You're a threat to them in that same regard. So uh, so now the homeless not aren't outlaws. They're now being forced into the condition and then treated like war criminals, potentially. Internment, like the Japanese and the Germans and the Italians and the Polish people in the United States of America. Oh, you only hear it about the Japanese, but there was all kinds of people that were put in, ca in internment camps because they were considered war criminals. If the homeless are considered war criminals because of a status the government has put on them and a condition that they put on them, doesn't that again prove, uh, you know, when you see them, I said we're living in a military consequence. Homeless are not treat, aren't helped. They're, they're, they're stolen from. They're utilized uh, for the benefit of the government. And we're watching that as crickets. We watch this go on. We complain about it. We think it's horrendous. We're, well, I don't know, again, I don't have the words. We just don't like it a lot, but that's where it ends, is not going to fix this thing. And all this has been going on as I get to this next tab. You start finding out this system really is changing in ways that are just not right, period. I don't care. There's just no rationale for it. Remember I told you ethics, when a, when a group of people look at ethics, ethics is gone. It's now adjusted into what they want in order to get the outcome they need. Uh, that uh, This is the thing about the human uh, chimera nonsense. It's as soon as they start looking at the ethics of even just doing CRISPR, uh, it's gone. It's going to happen, folks, and there's not going to be really any control other than the government coming in. And I then return you back to the United States of America, Title 50 of the United States Code, and you look at all the exceptions to the government that says you can't do this harm to people, but we can as a government. 
and you start to realize this place is wired different than any of us was talking about. And I say that miswiring and that rewiring requires that we relook at it, not just complain, but really understand how that rewiring is so we can go and unwire it. And it's going to take that because someone wired it and it's working. That thing is rewired the way it wants to go now. But now we get to the idea that I thought this next article didn't, doesn't really go far enough. Well, it starts the process. Finally, we get to the point where someone writes, rethinking national security. CIA and FBI are corrupt, but what about Congress? Okay, great. Finally, we have someone writing about it. I won't really talk about this, about what he talks about. I don't even know if I fully agree with where he goes with it. The point is, someone's now looking at, well, shit, okay, we got CIA as a problem and the FBI is corrupt. Uh, what about the Congress? Well, it's a caucusocracy, folks. So the entirety of government now is ex being exposed for its seedy underside. And, and all, it has been. I mean, that's all I think I talk about here is trying to, here, it's a, here's a problem. Let's see if we can get some people on it. Let's solve it. Here's a problem for you. Let's see if we can solve it. Here's a thing going on. Let's see if we can solve it. No, no, no solving. Just, just talking and complaining. So someone's saying, oh, we got a national security problem. What if I told you about the excuse of national security against your rights as a fraud? It covers all of that, doesn't it? Congress coming under the, and allowing the same fraud under the color of national security is the same problem. It's the same caucusocracy allowing it. And notwithstanding the weaknesses of so-called democracy and the voting problem, there's no steps to take to start outing this condition, which I've explained is a whole other path. There's a whole other pathway to start to out it. I appreciated that someone says, "Are we?" the rethinking part is what got me here. Let's rethink this whole thing, folks. I'm not saying we rethink it and try to move it into the direction of what we hear they want it to do. I say, as I've said before, let's go back to stuff and look again, the good stuff that was there that we've, we have abandoned and reassert those things, like gold for money, like property in uh, working through our private contracts instead of legalistic licenses. Now, what about our land, law of the land? How do we protect ourselves? No one enjoys this, but how do we go back and look at that to preserve those? Because those were supposed to protect, to preserve us, to protect us, and they didn't, and we're abandoning them by re trying to rethink, like, we can reinvent the wheel. And I'm saying, no, there's a wheel there that we don't need to reinvent. There's good parts about that wheel that we need to be cognizant of. And as long as we're, we're beating around the, the bushes here, uh, we're, not, we're just making noise, right? We're not really accomplishing much. So I appreciated the idea. Rethinking national security. What is that? When the sovereign so-called fails as derelict, as I've told you they were at 9-11, which invokes the very harm upon you that we are now under engaging, which Im Im uh, allows the next step of surveillance society, bringing on the very thing, uh, if you didn't know how the dimensional chess play game is being played, that brings on this international imposition that we call sustainability. Then you miss the whole trick there. And you'd miss in the setup on how this thing works. And at every point, we had the ability to interject ourselves and stop it. Whether we have to start locally, one by one, or we get bigger and we get bigger and bigger, and then it becomes a national consciousness thing. I don't know. It, and it's going to need to be that. But here, rethinking national security. What really is that is what I've been asking you to do when you, I tell you, address the national security as a fraud, as a pretense for in violating your rights in a violation of the trust duty of the government itself because it's not actually a sovereign. It is obligated. Where you can find its obligations and duties are to its grants, which I found in the, in the, in the law, land law. Uh, then it gave, a, a, gave me a glimpse, at least, folks. I think it gave me a little bit more, but that's okay. I'll, I'll stick with the minimum at this point. Don't get too big and arrogant for what we think about. I'm always testing what I know and how I look at it and how it's going to work, understanding the lack of response in people that we are really taking baby steps to come back, but we are taking those steps. Rethinking is what we need to do. We need to stop to agree, stop agreeing as we see the story coming out that the, the deception, the legal system around Assange is the same thing evidence in Blumenthal. It's the same thing in Vince in, in an asset forfeiture. It's the same thing that, that, that we're living under where now you just walk out and get killed by a cop because what happened after 9-11, you're all presumed enemy combatants. How about if we start rethinking that and then move beyond rethinking into action is what I've been asking you to do 
for a decade, been writing about it for a decade before that at least, and here we're finally coming to it in a writing, one writing finally, about let's rethink this thing. My question to you is do we want to rethink to the point that we think we're coming up with a new wheel, or do we want to step back and rely on a foundation from which we move that was more peaceful and and secure? Actually, not the one they invented. Not underneath necessities that throw it out of everybody's control and put it in the dis, into the discretion of a one officer in an executive branch, who we I already have proof will not answer to his obligations and duties. Well, how do I know that? Well, you just talk too much. No, we have four certified mail return receipts notices relative to enforcement of our judgment in 2013. They're focusing on the very derelict condition. The Office of President is the only one that can solve this thing, and they won't. And the answer isn't a threat to any of it. It shows you how terrible this is. They obviously may not understand, or they don't even want to broach the idea. And one little mining district is not going to be enough, enough of a coverage, enough of a promotion to get anybody inspired. But I've got the proof that this is not working, and it's not that, that we don't see it and not trying. It's that there's not enough of all you all that see your wrong in a way of action that it, that you prove won't get done to start outing what I see as the Epstein thing on a particular subject matter is every subject matter of harm. Look how if you keep pressure on it, it's not going to go anywhere. Unless the right people put the right pressure and continue the right things to get that boil to pop. And right now I believe they're trying to figure out how to make it go away inside the backside. You haven't seen, you know, if you and I would have committed a crime, you'd have been on the ground with a bullet in your back, and then they drag you to the hospital, and you'd be lucky to survive, and then you'd be thrown in a prison cell, right? And uh, the friends of Epstein won't come help you. Right, that's how that works. So there's a whole other condition going on. They're trying to figure out how to make this thing go away and make it look plausible for the public. This is the occupier. Don't piss off the natives method. Okay. The problem with this underlying thing is we're looking at uh, the dual citizen problem, the undue influence. There's another level here as well. And there's, an, again, we can go down the levels. I'm not... It's, if I can't get people to see the first one and act on it, we're not no sense to talk about the rest. That goes too quick. That goes too fast, and you out yourself to those that are quite not, aren't really paying attention to some little guy behind the woodshed on a pen, potentially no name network that actually should be having a whole lot more coverage. And maybe we ought to, and maybe that's why we don't, because they already know what's going on, and so we get sequestered here and there. That that could be an optimistic hope for me. Otherwise, there's just nobody, none of you, not many of you listening. And that's that's the problem. That's really the problem. And you're listening, but you're not hearing. And you're not acting on what you're actually supposed to hear. And we do, we lash out. That's a little bit of an infantile response, but that's what kind of what we do. Uh, because none of us like what we have. And so rethinking national security. Yeah, we need to rethink a whole lot, folks. But I think most of us, what we really have to rethink is rethink our response to this deception. That's the entirety of what we're now seeing. The caucusocracy is real. The worst has risen to the top and been allowed to rise to the top, and it runs the, this runs this stinking place. It's why it's the stinking abyss. We've allowed some of this. Now, we're kind of out of position on it, but that's not an excuse either. Yeah, so this other point, we start to look at what that system does. And uh, one of the things I, I focused on in this next story about the system, this legal system, how it also convolutes points and things is uh, an interesting observation, but it takes more of a concerted effort to read for these things. It's really overwhelming at some level. I found myself reading this, this decision really having to focus, uh, really focus on, on how to d discern what they were actually talking about. Because what caused my mind to look at this story was Oregon Supreme Court shuts down pretextual traffic stops, says cops can't ask questions unrelated to the violation. This is big right here to the extent that you hear that title. And not the pretextual stuff, but the 
can't ask questions unrelated to the violation is a monstrous decision for people. However, if you go read the case, they give guidance to the cops on how to remove the failure of what a dumb cop said and it made evidence for that they had to recognize of the general application that he did that he admitted he didn't do things specific to the requirements of the law, even if by a deceptive means. In other words, what we've talked about in the past, I read about the court cases, about reason, the difference between reasonable suspicion and probable cause, and when you need them, and the, when it triggers from this is the investigation to the arrest, they trigger differently under the Fourth Amendment. We've talked about this. This is, shouldn't be information that you don't understand. This court case talks to this stuff, and you'll find where the cop uh, didn't, uh, he just said he asked these questions unrelated, and he didn't give a reason, a probable cause, a reason, a probable cause in order to uh, in, to assert three or four steps. Because the evidence didn't show that he did that, the court found in favor of the driver who still got stopped lawfully for not turning on a signal when he made a turn. And so you got to read this case interest very carefully. But what caught me was Oregon court shuts down pretextual traffic stops, and then the conversation says that this, in the second paragraph, the writer says the Supreme Court says pretextual stops are fine, but once the objective has been achieved, citation or warning given, the stop is over. Now, that the Supreme Court says pretextual stops are fine was a violation to my senses, especially after the guy, the, the, the author says in the title that it shuts down pretextual stops. And so I've got an author that's all of a sudden in big, um, creates his own conundrum, if you will. He's an incongruity in it. And that forced me to have to go read the case. And in fact, these stops are pretextual. The government doesn't stop them that way because it's like uh, being able to shoot and kill you. All the cop has to do is say the right magic words. I feared for my life. That's what this court comes in and says. That's what they would allow it, had the cop done that. The, this case would not even made it this far. But the cop didn't. It, it got on the record. And this points out to how this system runs is making your record correctly. Don't allow a record to be made that's incorrect against you. And I, this will go across from criminal. This is a criminal case. Criminal for traffic, folks, if you haven't figured that one out either. Criminal or civil. This runs across the board on all this if you start to understand. I got a link to the court case, to the article. Uh, but this incongruity between allowing and stopping pretextual stops has really caught me, and you have to go read carefully. If you go read very, very, very carefully, you'll find out how the how the legal system has split the hairs and where they split the hair in order to give the state the advantage if the officer isn't too stupid to not figure that out. And so this is a big deal. And what I'm offering you here is it says the cop can't answer questions unrelated to the violation. Well, there's a whole other way to address this as well that was never will never be covered in these cases. I can't, I've told you about that before, and I don't want to start to get off on that side. Within the context of what they do, when you understand what they said here, and you go read that court case, you'll have a list of things in your mind on what not to allow a cop to say in order to stay inside the protection that the state would otherwise violate. In other words, that's anywhere. It doesn't mean a traffic stop. You don't give yourself over to things of their discretion. You don't give yourself over to their claim of discretion. You find a statement to counter, in the first instance, what they thought was discretion is exactly what I've been saying. This court touches on but doesn't speak to in those terms. Again, I read these news, these news articles, these opinion articles for facts that I can use if I need to, to apply to this dynamic in the world that's come against us as people. But we don't actually live in peace, and there's every excuse made everywhere to keep us from living in peace. And to expect in the first instance that we will be, uh, rights and property will be recognized. Again, asset forfeiture is the license to come after you without all that. No one has stepped up to argue that that's a crime. There are multiple felonies in to, to do that. Instituted by a guy named Biden quite a few years ago. 
and he's looking to be president now. So I don't, I don't know how much to explain more here. Let me uh, at least go to the, I got a law, just a generally, I just picked up what's a pretextual stop so we can kind of see what, what the dynamic is. The court doesn't talk about pretextual stops here in this case. That's why I had a trouble with that article. And this is that art. I rely a little bit on the guy. The guy is usually pretty good, I guess, from bringing up the concepting of what's in the case. This one was really terribly wrong uh, as far as trying to promote something. And it leads people in the wrong direction of thought. If you think that they allowed pretextual stop, but they, they stopped it, you'd miss the whole point. And you will continue to miss the point and make the wrong discussions and say the wrong things. That's my fear for you, if it's a fear. My concern for us is we act wrong. We pick up the wrong messages. And yet these are very important concepts to understand when at any time you could be done over by these people and, and potentially killed. So let me see what a pretextual stop is by just a law firm uh, definition here. Generally, generally, police officers are required to have either reasonable suspicion or probable cause in order to stop or arrest someone for a suspected crime. However, when police officers are unable to produce this reasonable suspicion or probable cause, they sometimes rely on a pretextual stop in order to detain someone. What is a pretextual stop? A pretextual stop is when a police officer detains an individual for a minor crime, like a traffic violation, because they believe that the person is actually involved or has committed another more serious crime. Because pretextual stop is fueled by the subjective opinion of the police officer, many people believe that these stops are illegal because they are based on age, race, or appearance of the individual. However, courts generally ignore police officers' subjective motivation when looking at whether their conduct was legal. That's as enough as I'm going to say. The pretext is looking for something other by using a traffic violation to stop you that to try and go after something that they can fabricate is larger. When you go read that case, the cop didn't have any other reason than the violation that he, whether fabricated or not, the crime of not using your drive, your turn signal here, folks. You've got to understand the nonsense behind this, too. He didn't articulate any reasonable suspicion other than the, the traffic uh, violation. And that made every other action an illegal act and that disavowed his evidence to be put in relative to the other charges. So this was inside the acceptance of a jurisdiction on a motion to suppress the evidence for that reason. An extension beyond the, re the rationale of the constitutional restriction on the officer in Oregon law. And so I say all this, it's a lot of words. If you look at how this hierarchy works, you look at how the courts are treating it, I looked at it, there's a pathway on developed for you, notwithstanding the hair splitting, and you would keep the whole conversation relative to the initiation of what stopped this issue, and you don't allow the pretext. You don't allow the things the court said the cop could have said to expand that. So they're still going to use traffic. That doesn't say that, that the court case didn't say that the the appeals court agreed with that. That's just reality. They're going to use this stuff as a pretext. The, the court's not fine with it because they didn't talk about it. That's what happens. That's what's been allowed to happen. Our job, if we want to rise up and, dis and defend ourselves, is to not let these pretextual things get into and expand the court's sanction for bigger and, and more intrusive invasion. In Oregon now, you can stop it right there, as I guess the point. He's not going to do it on his own. You get to stop it. He's going to go, and if you go read the court case, and I'm saying it this way, I want you to go read the court case. I want you to understand what the court says they can do. So you see the black and white. You don't take it from my opinion. That's a mistake. Or what my, my interpretation is, or what I tell you is important. You need to see how the court worked this out. Because you need to be able to stop that cop from doing those things that they've now been instructed to go do, and this one dumb cop failed to do. I can tell you they're trained to do it another way. This guy just did it wrong. I don't know that this case is going to happen again. Now that's going to be on everybody to make sure you stop what could have been a pretextual stop on a potentially on a valid, they call this thing, this traffic stop, a valid stop, a crime. They called it valid. 
And so you have to stop it there. You're going to have to have enough knowledge in you to stop it. This applies across every investigatory stop you might have by the government in any manner. It's the same thing, even though this was in crime. It's only the remedy for the government that's different. Your response is pretty much the same. And so, very important, very important that the court has finally come down to say, it only goes so far as the suspicion developed by the action. You don't use that as a license to expand. I'm telling you the reason how you're going, to, with the instructions the court gave to the cops now to affirm that, and what they'll be trained to do, you have to find what those, I think it's four things, and there's a couple more I know that they do. You need to be able to confine this, whatever the investigation is to the initiation of it and don't let it expand. They're going to make claims that you did something to threaten them. You've got to diffuse all that. It's not an argument. Now, a lot of that will, that, a lot of that get, will get responded, will, will be addressed if you, if you happen to listen to me for any time or you find it in the archives. I've talked about how to change the dynamic and the burdens, notwithstanding the pretext. No guarantees, but it puts the dyna it sets the dynamic different. It sets and it's and I've told you this stuff before, so it's not, not even what the court came up with isn't new. It, it's all I'm just I've already responded to that myself for you to you to explain how you do this. Even once you get into what they have give, been given, you can limit where they go, and it's your duty. And if you don't, unless you want to get abused more, it's your duty. It, it's not an argument that they have discretion and you call them a name. The, the law, the legal has given them the discretion. Don't argue. That's a waste of breath. You better be moving faster into where you, what takes away, what flips that burden, what causes a question on the record, even an oral one at the time. This is a dynamic thing. People are getting killed and in, in missing this one up. I, I mean, I don't even, I can't even, all the, these thoughts go through my mind. One of the things is about, they couldn't ask about a gun because he didn't have the reasonable cause. They'll create, see, this is the thing I have a, as a concern. They create the, they fabricate this. And you're going to have to have an understanding on, on how to stop that. How to stop the fabrication of the threat. And I've offered how that gets done when you do the proper response. When they, because they're not coming up thinking that you have a, a you're a threat. So that's your very first opportunity to continue the failure, the lack of, of assumption that there's a threat by, by entering into the proper dialogue, which changes the burden that he has to start thinking of. Pretty soon he's not thinking that you're a threat, except that you, he's found, he maybe have found someone who can catch him for doing the stop as a pretext. But now we get closer to that ingress and egress rights under road law, not underneath traffic. Anyway, getting over to this again. Protectural stops are set ups for other things that want to find you doing something worse. In Oregon, it's been announced, and I don't know how you do this in other states. Maybe go the full fo fo equal footing now relative to rights and due process that's been acknowledged. Uh, you say, well, you're going to stop this at every. This is where the cop can stop you lawfully, legally. And yet there's still a limit. You've got to see this. This is what happens to us over and over as a people. I don't care what subject matter I see. That's how this works. So I have a link to the, uh, to the, to the case. I don't remember. It's 26 pages long. It's not that long, but it's, you really have to concentrate on how the gyrations they go through to justify what they've done. This is really a big deal. This is a big, big precedent. The, the, the Oregon Supreme Court's finally stepped up and drawn the line underneath the Constitution. Don't forget that's sitting there. There's a constitutional limitation they're referring to. That's very important. In fact, you should be starting there and understanding what exceptions the court's legal has given to those so you can stay within the lines and don't let the other, the occupier, encroach on them by making the record of the encroachment and by the reason. It doesn't mean you win, but it is it sets the record of the violation. Now, one other thing I do want to point out, they go through and tell you how this court case, they give you a history of the court case. And they come to the Supreme Court finally and they say, the defendant again reasserts the challenge that he had put in in the, the very first court uh, hearing. I want you to think about that. Because I've said this before and the courts insist on it. It sounds like you're a complainer in that regard when you're defending yourself. At every step of the proceedings, you have to assert the defenses at every step. As soon as you don't, 
they're lost. The court makes a historic re record of the fact of the reassertion again. It wasn't good enough in the record the first two times. Had they not asserted this in the Supreme Court again, as a particularized thing, it would not have been addressed. If your record's not starting out with the with the proper statement, and at every step of the way, as I've told you before, prior to plea, af just after the plea, during the trial, at the arraignment for your rights, uh, your, oh, darn it, just slipped my mind, there's a right you have right at the, at the sentencing, it, did, it just slipped my mind, and then in every step after to appeal, they will not look at your, look at your objection. They will not look at your defense. And so look, read for that too. If you fail at any time to assert your defenses, they will forget them. And so it was a, well, probably one of the more important things I noticed. That was right up in the beginning of the case. They made sure to tell people that this has been reasserted as a violation so we can hear it. Otherwise, they don't hear it. Again, this is not the courts of old that I used to read that the courts looked at a case and, and did justice. You only get what you've continually worked to assert. That's why I say do it ahead of your plea. Do your avoidances ahead of plea. Those are actually more powerful, but you have to continue them at every stage, and then they, they will, I think they're looked at if you ever get there, and again, you likely will have to have this legal representative to do this because they don't listen to you if you don't. If you go down the track within the case, you don't. As a collateral attack, I don't know either. They just want to get you gone is, if you do it that way. Which is, so that you put that in before you enter plea because that that if you do all these avoidances up front and you keep them up you don't lose them at the plea you don't lose three quarters or more of them at the plea uh, which is why you have to understand how this works a lot of people don't think this is going to happen to you a lot of people say oh it's just a traffic ticket i'll pay the money this is how they they give in getting us this is how they've expanded that authority to the point that the cop was so lackadaisical about the due process. He just told, he just won the record. He had no scruple to say he had a certain requirement to do, and he had a reason. He he had no no. It's gone so bad he didn't even think he had to mention it on the record. This time the court caught that. They're treating you without any thought of re, of due process at all. And you're allowing that because of the way that, again, this legal deception is on us, and none of us really step up. I say the none with a condition. Uh, none of us really step up in, in the right way, and I'd say most of us don't step in the proper way. We step into the the implausible place trying to and then complain that we had no rights. And speaking of stepping into a place and having no rights, I'll move on. The pretext. Uh, we get to go through what other people walk into the discretion of other people and then complain. A thing has come up uh, within uh, YouTube I want to just touch on because, it, and this is where I think I did to go to the, the COPPA. I may come to the term what that means. Uh, everyone that has read that probably knows it better than I do. It's that child protection services thing on the internet. At any rate, YouTube says it has no obligation to host another anyone's video. Was in this new thing that's coming up and uh, some of it to be implemented by the first of the year. It's coming up now, the YouTube policies. I want to touch base on walking into someone's authority, and then we get the problem of the public-private interference, and where does that place people, and how, whether or not you understand it correctly and address it more correctly, and potentially more correctly, because this is all kind of thrown into a question between the, the provider, the third party, the private property they're going to defend against a federal interposition of rules, that is made to be vague enough to do enforcement, but may be so vague as to bring you into liability as a creator. And so I want to move on to this. Uh, again, my problem with all this is misinterpreting what we're told, how we read, what people write to us. We don't go to the law. Like in this case, I went to the court case. The Supreme Court has decided that's considered to be the law now. I went to that case, and I, re I, I took a lot of time to read through that case to get a better uh, what's the up-to-date interpretation on what they're doing relative to these pretextual stops or traffic issues and what they're going to extend to the cops, what they told the cops they're going to do, what the cops will start doing and probably eliminate. You can't even use this this case right now. You're going to have to get into the case to defend yourself from within the confines of what they've extended to the cops. That is the problem here. 
You can't just say they can't use pretextual stops and just argue that. They will bring the next list of, que of uh, necessities upon you that you will have to counter, really counter ahead of time. You have to anticipate them. But YouTube says no obligation to host anyone's video. So this is now coming out. But what was attached, it wasn't really that. To me, that's okay. Like I said, I'm not on YouTube. I'm through RLM's account, and I'm posted there. Don't have a YouTube. Like I said, I don't have a Facebook I would be pretty silent in the in the digital world if it wasn't for the help of uh, RLM and Grimner and uh, like Grammy Mary doing Spreaker. I, I wouldn't wouldn't be out much. You know, I did the little Twitter and I did the Mines and, uh, and oh the F F N network F N site. Yeah, I did a little bit of that, but I don't get any reaction. So it, I'm really confined. I really didn't buy into a lot of this stuff, uh, and I don't know what good or bad that is. But getting involved and and now having a potential liability on you. Uh, it become uh, on any of us now becomes a, a, a question, and I hadn't thought about it too much. I just don't care one way if they if they want to cut out and Grimner doesn't do any monetization anyway. You know, we cut out of the commerce side, all that kind of thing, and yet you see this issue where YouTube keeps confining them, explaining what they're really there for. And I tell you, and I've told you this for years, this is the communication center, one of the centers. They get you involved so they can get their data, so they can do their analytics on you and do whatever they want to get done. And we don't know where all that's going to go. It's pretty shocking when you hear some of the paperwork coming out. So they come right up front and they say they have no obligation to host anyone's video. Okay, so that's one thing. They can cut you out. And everyone screams and yells about that. Uh, but th this became a little more important when I saw somebody uh, on one of the videos talking about this uh, COPPA. The children's, there it is, children's online privacy protection rule. Uh, that uh, they were, people are complaining that they're going to cut whole swaths of people off of YouTube. And so that's pretty serious. And I didn't understand how that would affect anything I do. I don't do anything with the children. And I don't do, uh, well, let me, listen, it, under the rule, it's general audience or mixed audience. It's not mixed audience. It's general audience. The general audience, I'm not, I'm not pandering to the kids. I don't care about any money. I don't care about any money from kids. Now, that said, anybody who's young enough to understand me, I want listening. I want to listen to what I'm saying, and I want them to think about what I'm saying as they grow up and they understand what they're starting to be, how they can, uh, well, what they learn to discern. So although I'm not a kid's, uh, certainly not kid-friendly, I would hope a whole lot of young folks listen. Right? I don't know. I'm putting maybe a lot of faith on my knowledge to you all, but it seems to help. So I think they need to help. And anyway, so that creates a potential problem in the nuance. Because I know administratively, because of all the administrative stuff that we do, they have created that deference case, that Chevron case, deference, that if you walk into that, you're, you're not, you're toast. Not just, you're toast. And so complying with COPPA, uh, this uh, Children's Online Privacy Act, would think, you would think on the surface it means nothing to those webs, and it just extends to websites, not just YouTube. When you go read the law, which a lot of people weren't even talking about, it really irritates me when, especially lawyers, they, you want to talk about lawyers, they talk about, they don't ever give you the law. What they do is they do exactly what we find they do is they go to the rule first, never, not ever, hardly ever the law. I found one guy that does, and that's the link you're going to get. He actually is pretty succinct in how he describes this. He actually offers the sides of the points. He offers what you might want to try and think to do. Uh, but I'd already read the rule until I came across his uh, and, and so I had my own I thought, ideas. Within that, it was very clear this, uh, this is a serious thing. This is a serious thing because it's a third-party bias that's built into the rule that a creator could come under. But if you go through the rule, the, the, the code, excuse me, first, and then the rule, you'll see that there's limitations. It's like I've told you they're there. And I would now say, because of what I saw coming from the Internet, all this uh, sensationalism around it needs to stop. I guess that's my main thing I started looking at. What is this thing that's got everybody all, all weirded out about? It? It's not what I've heard most people talking about. That said, the link I'm going to tell you, I've sent you for the, for the uh, video says, you, what is it, uh, you won't, you're wrong about COPPA. Well, I, I thought that was an insult. I wasn't wrong about COPPA after I read it. I read it before I locked, looked at that. So this guy's a little bit arrogant on what he thinks we all know. And this is the problem. This is what goes on. We have to know better. And the way we, uh, what he's probably responding to is the way most of y'all did videos on responding how COPPA was going to destroy us. Well, it has this potential, but not really. And that's going to pretend, 
that's going to pertain to what you understand and how you respond. And it's all written down. This is black and white. Maybe for the first time, those of you folks that want to stick around may have to go read the law so you understand that there is a limit to it. In fact, the, the uh, FTC, which is an interesting agency to, to do this, the Federal Trade Com Commission, that's really fraud, fraud in ads and all that stuff. Interesting way they came at you. Okay, so you have to look for that vulnerability. I'm going to give you this link uh, to the FTC Gov. It's a fact, uh, frequently at questions. If you go through and read that, it'll give you the line out of the limitations that this act is supposed to do. Now, that said, there's two provisions I found that do potentially find uh, uh, find a problem. And you, a creator has no control over it, which is the problem. You have no information underneath the act that says that you'd be that operator, yet the rule says you are you are an operator. So there we have a problem. And that's what you have to protect against instead of all the sensationalism I'm hearing out there. So I also give you some links to title. The, I wanted to know where is, where is this code. So you type it in the Internet. Why is that so hard? And up pops Title 15. That surprised me. I didn't realize this was FTC, FTC for trade, and it wasn't something else. And so now we find out the jurisdiction has a question, and uh, but that's where you go, Title 156501. That though, they don't refer to that. The, the, the attorneys, the two attorneys I was looking to uh, see, well, what did they think about this thing uh, after I had read it? What are they saying? The first attorney on this, I had to argue with, with the guy right off the bat. I mean, it was like ongoing argument. And then he never produced the fact of the law. He always spoke from the rule. The same problem we have in land law. They speak from the rule instead of the law. And the rule defeats you because you, you're admitted underneath the jurisdiction when that jurisdiction may be failed and faulty. And so it, the analysis is a little different that I, I bring. I would hope that you're going to bring something like this. And this is a problem. This thing is a problem, but it's not just for YouTube. It says all websites. And then the problem is that they talk about speaking to kids and really getting information from. It's the very first definition is you get information from is the subject matter. From a child, it be, brings you into potential potential uh, subjectness to this COPPA. The problem is they've got two provisions in the rule and third-party interference that could bring you into that, even if they're wrong. And that's the thing I look at you need to, I think you'll need to protect against. And I don't know too much more because I don't understand how the YouTube does it. It's not in force and effect yet. I'm not seeing whether or not they restrict content based on this. My opinion is on this, on an opinion level, consistent with where this thing goes on a big data issue, is that they're really, they did, YouTube did this on purpose this way, even though it cost them a ton of money. Maybe they didn't do it, they didn't want to do it like this, but They've opted for taking the route that would require that the Internet be look like one giant porn site. And you'll have to sign in and register to some high level in order to gain access. Is my interpretation on one way this thing can go. Because if they're not going to recognize the built-in, what they call age gate, you'll hear talked about, and I know nothing about this until I heard it from there, then go read about it. The age gate, and it's not the Epstein gate, it's not... Watergate, it's not Siri gate, it's not Russia gate. No, it's age gate now. Only this time it works against you. All right, so this age gate doesn't work. They're not, they're gonna, whether they abandon it or not, I don't know. But to do the other way means that you're all deemed to be children, wards of the state, under eight, under 13, which they might raise that up, and you all have to give them for information in order to use these services. It's no different than my seeing that they're now requiring, what, Brit in Britain, a face, uh, biometrics to access the porn, or in China, anything on the Internet. I see this as an integration somehow in one, one con con construction. And so that's my, my view there on that. And if we don't watch out, and you do have a way to talk about this because it's now in a federal agency. What have I talked to you about, about comments? You can have a say. The problem is, I'm told by one of the videos, you only have till tomorrow. So those of you that want to spin out a comment real quick, send a comment to the FTC, say you just found out you don't have enough time to respond. Extend the time for comment. And maybe put a couple of things that you hear in the video as quick line items and get your record done so that you can extend, or potentially extend the time for this. Why is that important? Because you have the ability as a creator or any website who sees these two other 
provisions where third parties can use and deem you to be doing things that when they see it, right or wrong, and bring you into liability, bring you into have to defend in an administrative context. These two provisions need to be ended, and you can do that in a comment. You can at least put yourself on the record, those of you that want to do this. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to just throw in here. Uh, this is kind of serious in a way. I don't feel that much of a threat, but when some third party can come out of the blue and don't think I don't know about this with an, a Clean Water Act citizen suit relative to my work in the mine, and some environmental agency, uh, uh, an NGO can come after me, you don't think I don't know about this, is exactly what I'm seeing here has been given over by the way they made the rule. The, they made the cookie a problem. The lawyers say they did that. Oh, I hear cha-ching. And so we've got a problem here, I think, uh, that we can actually engage, not hysterically, go in and look at the rules. So I've given you the link to this, this, the code, Title 15 USC, and you have a rule implementing that code at 16 CFR. I've given you the links. You can find these. I've given you uh, what I thought was a good legal eagle. I think he, he goes through the thing really, really well. He even explains the other attorney that I had heard first. He doesn't agree with that guy so well in some points, even though they're friends. So this is attorneys that, that will tell you they don't quite get this. And that's another problem with the rule. It's supposed to be clear to people. All right. So this is if you start parsing through the specifics, there's bullet point line sentences you could build into a comment or be prepared for making a disclosure, a notice. And I've already when I was reading the, the statute and then the rule, my mind clicked into making a notice, which may I don't know yet. It may on a content provided basis by content provided basis. Notice in the description of every video I may be putting together. I don't know yet. What came out for me was to address and how to address this implication that the YouTube is working on your behalf as a creator or any website is working on your behalf when it accepts cookies or when it puts an ad that you didn't know about on your content because you mentioned uh, the little goats. And all of a sudden, up pops in the ads. I don't get the ads. See, I got a block on it. I don't get the ads. I don't even know what this thing actually looks like, what they're feeding to you, most of you all. But I uh, understand an ad will pop up. If I start speaking about the little goats, uh, all of you all will get some some kind of hat show up or some shoes with goat fur, I guess. But, uh, but that's the... So I talk about children. All of a sudden, some children toys pop up for the adults, the kid in you. That without response, could be deemed on your behalf as, part as participating with the children. And this is the problem. And so I, my thought is I maybe make a, dis and it's not a disclaimer, it's a notice. And it's I, the way my mind works, I'm working to, to flip that burden always. And it's a, quite a long statement, actually. It's kind of nonsense. I told you this before, too. Your descriptions now underneath your videos will probably have to be legal notices or disclaimers or everything because that's what they're turning this place into. It won't protect your channel. It won't do anything. What it does is it protects you. This is looking at protecting you from third-party interference where if they want to come after you, they fabricate something, and then they get the justification through this obscure uh, be on behalf angle or where the data wasn't immediately, the data collected wasn't immediately destroyed. And they attribute you to have the knowledge. You have to flip all that around. It's all written down what they're going to do. You just have to go after that. Stop. I'm asking you all folks, stop becoming sensational on, on just the fact that your YouTubes are going down. There's another thing going on. And I actually believe it's really the bigger big data, data collection bring you all into the fold underneath this future that they want. I really believe that's where it's going. We can kind of inter we can put sticks in those spokes pretty well if we just would. So okay, I didn't I don't know what I I hope you uh, heard some things I've said. I want to relate over to the video. I'm, I'm not okay. The explanation I think is really good. So that's what I want you to hear. I want you to understand the real condition, the problem. On the surface, people who don't uh, have children, content for children, you would think are out of it. That's why I didn't think it would even pertain. These two little provisions of third-party interference, though, and the behalf, the working as an agent, these sites working as your agent is a problem. 
You may not even intend. I don't think any of this stuff that we have in our RLM would matter, and it may not ever matter. But if someone was to focus on somebody on RLM, they could make the problem. That might be able to be written out of a rule if some of you all would comment to it. Now, you only have one day, I understand. Maybe an email could be sent off by tomorrow, and but I would ask for extension of time uh, that you didn't have a comment and there's major issues that haven't been discussed and you just got word of it. And that might be enough to, to give, they might extend the time if enough of you do that. Otherwise, you put in the bullet points that you know, that you think, you go to the law, you cite it, you show how the problem is, and you pass that in. Why? Because I, we found, uh, and this is the way it works, if you make an objection, you get on, you have standing. You have standing on the administrator side, side and if you turn around, you also have defense on the, on the civil side. Remember those cases I've read to you? If they violate you, you don't have to exhaust administrative remedies when in your rights. You have to find those even within the context of the public-private partnership now because of the FTC integration. In some regard, the FTC is trying to solve a problem, and I get that. I'm a proponent against exploiting the children, right? But, but the way this thing ends up working out, in particular the way it seems the lawyers have kind of adulterated it all, it's, uh, it becomes this thing that, as I say before, you have to be ahead of the potential. Not get sensational and not get off point and do the, the wrong thing. And I say, only guidance that I have for you about what the right thing is, I can't tell you what the right thing is, if they, if you hand this over to Chevron defense type uh, uh, deference, anybody would be pretty much toast, I think. So you have to anticipate that Chevron deference the court will give to an agency by you address their jurisdiction. And this may come up to whatever constitutional violations, any constitutional property things that you have, as my mind work to undermine, as I tell you to do all the time. You convert that color of authority under COPPA to take your product, your your production, your creativity, and turn it into something subject is an extortion, isn't it? If it's under the color of authority and they don't can't prove the actual warrant. And so that's kind of what my mind turns to. How do you make a notice that would do that? And I've written down something. It's not going to be implemented quite yet, but I'm fielding it right now because I see a lot of people going hysterical. And a part of me, and the reason why I'm covering this at least at all, and to this extent, as long as we're hysterical about all this stuff and we have the wrong idea, we miss the underlying real problems that we really either need to solve or that we were attacked by that we didn't be it, we weren't able to respond to. It's that same problem of not paying attention to the proper thing and being being hit by the proper thing. We don't address that proper thing. Knowing about a thing doesn't address it. Anyway, all these things I keep telling you behind the woodshed are at play. Uh, it, it, to my, I'm talking nonsense here at some level that if it doesn't apply ultimately. The problem is, is that third party, if I could say citizen suit, even by agency, the agency, problem. They determine by, when they have a list of factors that they determine and have deference upon, and no one has commented against the fact that it can cause a, a bias or prejudice or wrongful takings, if you will, then they will proceed as if it's correct. And so in some regard, I'm also saying those of you that get hysterical and want to predict the future, how all your all your, your sites are going to be, all your channels are being taken, you've predicted your future of that because you didn't do better. You didn't focus in on what you actually needed to do relative to the real threat. Or the, in this case, it's a real perceived threat because when you have it in the agency, it's a deferential problem. They get deference for what they do. This as law becomes law. And I understand we're not even talking about YouTube. YouTube becomes this interesting behalf agency. And they pass through, the way they did this is it starts to pass through the problem to you. You have to turn that around as well, which is the way my mind works to do. You have a there's a way to at least give the notice, as I've told you before. If I don't want you reading my email and you're the government and I went encrypted, I now have evidence when you broke the encryption, I intended it to be private. You needed to now do what, folks? And we just talked about it. You needed to have, when you seized my email and inf invaded it, you had to have a real good lawful reason. You had to have probable cause. If you don't do that, they begin with reasonable suspicion, if that much. Pretext is good enough, isn't it? So, again, as I read through this, 
we have a we have a condition that's going on. The future is changing here. The, the, there's a rethink that needs to happen. I want us to do that rethink in the proper way and the right and proper responses. But the most important thing is there is a proper response, not just any response. Uh, my little bit of my disappointment this last week was watching um, a bit of the sensational and the hysterical in a way when I and I'm just and this is before I read what COPPA does. Just the assertions didn't even sound that they would be plausible in law. Even for as corrupt as it seems, and as, as deferential as it is, as, as, as vague as it is, it, it was out, out of the pale of even that. And so we as a people, we that are interested, these, those of us that are passionate, that are on the Internet, that do use the websites, the Internet of Things of Constructed Prison, you will have to have a better understanding of it. This may be your first opportunity to do that on a fairly simple and straightforward law, notwithstanding the the, the two uh, vagaries, the, the two um, improper, excuse, excuse me, the two improper implications of a creator having knowledge of the data, having taken the data, when all he does is put up, a, or she does is put up a put up a piece of content, and Google, uh, Google essentially, YouTube runs the rest of it. This goes for any website, though. And yet you go into the fact of this, the FAQ, and you read how the the FTC is actually going to interpret it, notwithstanding some of these subtle incongruities within the context of the reality that a, a creator knows and does and the the lack of knowledge that he has. You have to be of actual knowledge. So you need to show in a comment there's no way you can become of actual knowledge, yet the rule will improperly impose upon you as if it does. It's creating a misrepresentation, isn't it? And so that's what's one line sentence. You just throw it out there. And then you say, if you only have line item sentence, and that's all you have, then you say, uh, and uh, I, would, I don't have more time because the, the thing I just found out about this, I'd like to be able to expound on these, uh, extend the time. Uh, we've done that before, and they do that. Uh, not, not based on one, I'm sure. But listen, even in the numbers of listeners that are listening to me, the minor amount of numbers versus the population is enough to sway that 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 agency to hold off more time to allow you guys to settle all down, all you gals to settle down, look at what the law, the black and white really is, look at the position of the FTC, find these incongruities that I think the video, for the time being, enumerates very good, very well. He uh, applies a weak constitutional provision, which I'd throw in anyway. There might be more, but this is coming too fast, so put that in. I mean, say we, this is the best I could do in the short time if I found out yesterday. That we need more time. Uh, this is this is a serious issue that's going to bring harm, uh, inadvertent, unintended consequences onto content creators uh, that they're not liable, actually liable for, or something. Whatever you want to say, it's not that hard. To, you don't have to come up with a thesis. It's just your participation. Those of you that are on YouTube, I don't know why thousands and thousands of people aren't listening behind the woodshed to understand this is what you should do instead of what I see you doing, which is going hysterical at some level, uh, going secessional and 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 then you see that that eventuality come on, and then you wonder why, and you and you blame those with the discretion. It's, 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 that's kind of a a bit of an insanity. You know they have discretion, and then you condemn them for it, for using it. What what is that? I mean, it makes no sense. So here we keep going along. We have something we could respond to. It can affect you, likely may not, but you never know when you've got a third party stakeholder that can come and beat you about the head and shoulders just because they can set the rule against you. And I deal with that. I've had to deal with it relative to the Clean Water Act and what we do in mining. Not applicable, but there's this little provision for a citizen suit that's so much trouble. They can bring you into court and throw this on you, and you can't get out of it, and you can't do much about it. You can't twist and turn because of the way, again, the courts are constraining your property. You're not supposed to, but they are. you got to be able to anticipate that. And so I, I keep saying the record ahead of time is important. This is a this administrative record is important to try to get involved with, and there's no jeopardy, none at all. Just get out there, and then you get you actually get your standing to protect yourself when it wasn't addressed, right? So here's why would you object to all that? Something to do instead of complain and type on nonsense, you could actually be t putting together in 15 minutes the the letter, and, and e I'm sure you can email. Just find the FTC website. They're going to have a link that you just probably email it put down the information they want. It's a little bit of a form lever you have to build. Do it, folks. What's so hard? And then send, send up a, 
a follow-up if you want, uh, return receipt requested in mail. So you start your record. Get involved. Get, get in there where you can defend yourself in the future just, just in case. And in the meantime, you learn, you practice how to do this better. The more formal book report, if you will. The more formal response they told you when you were in school. There's nothing really outside of that in some regard. It's just focused into things, of some legal thing you've been told you can't do and shouldn't have to do, and, you're, and you don't want to do it anyway like none of us. Who wants to do any of this stuff? But this is the reality we're living in anymore. you got stakeholders that interfere with your life. That should have been a crime. When we didn't call that out, when we keep engaging it, we get into the minutia, uh, we, what do we expect? We, we give them the air to breathe. We give this the air to breathe. Scream and yell otherwise, and they're going to come on with this thing, and we won't really know why a, a channel disappears, but all the opinions will be that it was uh, what? Because you, you had something really good to say, and they didn't want you to say it? Is that a proof? Maybe it's because you just didn't follow the guidelines that were actually reasonable. If, if they're trying to protect children, notwithstanding this, this incongruity, there shouldn't be anything that interferes with anything that we're doing. Anybody I know, maybe there's people out there do things for kids. I, I don't know. And maybe they were exploiting. I, I hear the history is that they did. None of us, nobody I know does any of that. And yet there's this thing inside the rules because maybe the FTC does not know. And because they are only being listening to certain people that are in the cha-ching side to make the questions so they get more cha-ching, that there isn't a statement on really how this how this actually works. And that needs to be brought to the table, if you will. And that may make all the difference. The failure to put that in, it's going to be assumed on you that you now are the pass-through liability. And that becomes a problem. So just like a citizen suit relative to the Clean Water Act. It's no different in my mind. Uh, DHS wanted to add U.S. citizens to a long list of people subjected to mandatory face scans at airports, but has backed down for now. You see how they assume you in, you're all presumed to be viable, and then some pressure comes, and it knocks them back out and knocks them back away. Now, this is probably just telegraphing what they're going to do. This is no different than my thought that this action by YouTube actually brings on the, the pornify the Internet, in order for you now to register and be big data into the ability to access the Internet, they get you practice to that. They're not telling you that they're going to do face scans at airports. They back down. I think I did a little bit of report on this it's planning in. The, pro the point is, is this is the DHS. This is back into the big data thing. This is in the biometrics. This is, goes into the what? The real ID. And I think that's on a tab here. Yes, that's coming. And I think thank you to Rob Works for bringing my attention to this uh, this one story, uh, it, although it was around. But it focused me at a certain time with this uh, to bring this together. The, remember who you're dealing with, the DHS. The FTC is a federal agency. These uh, agencies don't not speak together now. In fact, there's more and more evidence they speak more and more together because there's companies, third parties. Remember I told you it's the third parties that are going to be the problem. The contracting with the government, this is like a fascism, uh, in order to keep and make an integration of maybe agencies that should have stayed separate. Uh, when you don't realize your real ID is a commerce-connected uh, document and that it has now standards because you're now, everyone's presumed to be the enemy combatant. In the Internet, in the future, you're going to be, be considered, a, uh, where they pornify the Internet, you're going to be a pervert. Uh, in, underneath the terrorism, you're, you're considered an enemy combatant. You're all presumed this. Completely violated your due process. Nobody stepped up. I went to crickets. Now we're to here where they're doing the face scans. The pressure was we knew the DHS would get to this point eventually. Yeah, this is my problem. I've said that. Now this article says it. We knew that. Where have we been? But we didn't even respond. But he goes, uh, since the beginning of its biometric scanning program rollout, the DHS has planned on adding U.S. citizens to the list of people forced to trade their faces for air, air travel privileges. So far, the program has been limited to suspicious foreigners which is all of them, including those here on visas, 
but uh, on about a recent filing caught by Zach Whitaker of TechCrunch says flying the United flying in the United States would soon require adding yourself to the government's facial recognition database. This is not anything that I haven't reported here already. This is now someone else seeing it. They also talk about homeland uh, the homeland security tied in will have to be through the TSA, won't it? So you're looking at again this conglomeration of federal agency that is pulling your biometrics together. They're feeding everybody with the idea that you are presumed guilty, why you have to be underneath the database, which we find out in a in various places uh, that it's a global system. In other words, what also came out in this next story, Bill Gates wants to export India's national ID system around the globe. But I told you about the Indian program and China. Remember, I said they're coming out, they're testing it in those those uh, in, in population gr amount systems because that's a good test for the globe and they come out. Well, Bill Gates is the front man for a lot of this. And this came through a story, I think, like I said, what Rob works for my, uh, gave me the heads up for, for this. It, uh, Bill Gates, of all people, Microsoft guy, wants to come out and, or ex-Microsoft guy, if you think that way, uh, he wants to come out and, and, and export this, right? National ID. You look inside the story, and I think I reported on this other aspect at the time the real ID was brought out, I think I reported that they were contracting, that they were looking for contractors to be the producers of the uh, real ID card, which is a biometric, I think it's RFID type card. It's got a lot built into it. Uh, they were looking for someone to make it. Well, this is the company, India's Adhar National ID program, I think is the same one that the, I think it's the same one that the, um, uh, the DHS, Com commission to do the real ID. And so this Indian company is the same one, the same company that does the real ID for the United States. Is it, is, I reported that but a long time ago, that of all the, and now today, the, now of all the contractors, the DHS would pick a foreign one that is global in connection to the World Bank, no less. As we see in this story, as, every, as the news tells you what's happening, and we'll just read the very first part of this. It's not just a social credit score system. Remember, I told you China was the pivot where they were going to bring and test and move it out. A new, in fact, I sent a link into the chat room. Their new um, video out by one of the PBS programs or something talking about the future of AI. They admit they is like a compilation of everything I've told you behind the woodshed relative to AI, relative to the the data, the China, they even say China is an, ex one section of China is an experiment for the implementation of this. They talk about tie uh, tying AI to it, which is all just pattern recognitions, uh, getting face scans. They're telling you that it's over there. Uh, the story is really biased, and it's not telling you it's over here. What China does as an authoritarian, you might hear the term an authoritarian capitalism, it, it, they pay for this infrastructure. They're going to get you to pay for it in the United States and are already getting you to pay for it. It's going to be invisible. It's already invisible in the United States. And so this Bill Gates wants to export the National ID system. They want to give you notice that it's coming from India. What you don't realize, and this story acknowledges, and I talked about a long time ago, that the company who is going, going to get the contract is really globally connected. Now, I could go through the story. You can see it. These apps that they use on the Internet, that go th they all go through this thing. You'll see this, uh, I think PBS is a PBS program, talking about the AI, what's going on. They're, they're showing you a dynamic between the, the war of the Cold War of the Futures, China versus the United States, relative to artificial intelligence and really data acquisition, this big data. And we, and they say we, well, for the United States, we, they live off of data. I've been saying stop giving them, stop feeding them. Stop integra integrating with it. And you know, it's interesting to read, to watch that video, and the nuances that they learn, what they call from the dust of your exhaust of your interaction. They can pick up a lot of stuff from you, and they make lots of money. Uh, but to hear this, Bill Gates, philanthropist, he wants to rationalize in a video I saw, you'd think it'd be, you're irrational. He's saying you're irrational if you don't think that this would be a good thing. This would keep people who are on government programs from saying they're more than one people and all. And the problem is that that's not how it implements. This becomes a requirement for everyone, and you have nothing unless you are on this system. And then you're sought, you're sought after and destroyed if you're not in it. That same facial recognition that doesn't have your face in the thing acquires your face and then identifies you're not in the system. They show that in that video as well from China. You're then a targeted. 
As I told you, I found out if I was thinking about going down the highway, if you didn't have a certain sensor on your car when you go over a highway sensor and you don't trigger that, but they have your car, they realize that you also didn't communicate who you are, they're going to come track you down and find out. And this is where you then better have the better answer, a lot better answer than what I hear uh, in the world today. But they go through here, this article ties it together, the THS, THS uh, Real ID is made by the same company that's already doing the India thing. Uh, they are doing tests. This guy from Microsoft uh, used to be Bill Gates. Same thing, the guy that wants to do your vaccine programs around the globe. Same guy that said that the only equation to stop climate change and carbon is to get rid of the people producing it. The people are expendable. He wants to bring this national ID and can't see any problem with it. And so you let people like this have influence and continue it without a counter say, they're going to get that future. And then we see this, Microsoft funds facial recognition technology secretly tested on Palestinians. First of all, why secretly? Why on the Palestinians? Why in cooperation with the Israelis who are occupiers and in no good standing internationally as well either? Why are they in that when they want to talk and you look at the guy who founded this thing, wants to bring na a national uh, ID to you, and then we find out, over here, the DHS wants to do back down on facial recognition. You think that's going to last long where Microsoft funds facial recognition technology to be secretly palest on Palestinians where the Israelis are pushing us and this country is half run on more than half uh, of the those people? Uh, how is this not going down, down the tubes uh, on its own because of that? We don't stand up. Not because of those people, but because we haven't reasserted against that at all, at all anything that would protect ourselves. We, we, like the one uh, good gentleman, I wish I could remember his name, it was a good, uh, a good thing to do. Uh, California Initiative, he initiated a law. I don't know why he turns around and then uh, and avoids the vote, but he gets the, poli the lawmakers to pass a law that allows you to inquire on what a company has, in, I guess in California, of the information they have and data on you and tell them they can't use it for commercial purposes. I don't know why it wasn't simpler. You just don't collect the information and keep it for, for, for any purpose. But at any rate, that's not... Why do we allow this thing and we don't say anything else that where there's evidence that you can disallow it or disallow some of it? Then we see Microsoft funding the secret use of on Palestinians. Why them? And if they're willing to do that to an occupied people, what about you in America that don't know you're occupied? How much benefit is it is in these corporations that are just, when you see this other video from the PBS uh, about AI, it's just about, again, just wanton profit, and it's really not profit, but, you know, the, the digits, the, the debt, the debt instruments. And we wonder why, we, who, what these companies and corporations work with, they'll work with a, an illegal occupier, has no, no sense of, it's a war criminal over there in the Middle East, it would work against uh, Palestinians secretly, no less. You know, and then we read this story. The FBA bowed to industry for decades as alarms were sounded over talc. I don't even care about the talc thing. The point is that the agencies are wired to implement what? Commerce. That's what they're there for. And without an objection against that constitutional pre-wiring, where it has overstepped that position by the way it is it unduly influenced it's not actually working for the public interest in you the public is them the government we see that there's no evidence that if we needed it we now have evidence and this is what the whole point of this story is the fda bowed to industry influence is evidence i could care less about the talk it's evidence the fda is not upholding that uh, obligation and duty to the people where it allows itself why do I say that? Because we want to attack the deference extended by the Supreme Court that it's an authority. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to attack that? Because it says that they cannot be trusted. Trust. Confidence. What they're mandated to do, we now have evidence they cannot be presumed to be doing. Let's rethink, as I said earlier, rethink this place. I think it's really important. But what do we rethink about? Rethink how this the cockistocracy has gra uh, grabbed this place and run it off the rail, run it off the tracks. 
taking it over the edge. We all know that they do that. We hear about the revolving door. Maybe that's the thing that you start highlighting on to attack so that they don't have the presumption of law. My thought on rethinking this is to destroy the presumption that the courts gave the government itself that it's a presumption that it's right. And here's one of the first evidences that we can start to use, not our opinion, the fact of evidence countering. Remember, it's a presumption. You can rebut the presumption with sufficient evidence. This is, can't be the only story. I've reported on this kind of influence, this undue influence, for years, asking you all to step up and make a comment exposing it in different ways. The fact is, this is evidence, not a story about the industry bowing. It's, it, it, we know that. Now, what are we going to do with that fact? What are we going to do with that harm that's created because of it? How long we had to wait the court cases that came out that now we get the evidence from. Remember I told you, you can get a court case if you do it right just to get the discovery. That, then you then move on. It's kind of like a cop doing that, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to have a suspicion. I'm going to do some investigation. I make a plausible claim and I get discovery to find out, wait, whoa, there's some more stuff in here now. Now that I, I couldn't get it until I do it, now I can use that as a tool. And so, I can go on, that all ties back to what I was saying earlier in the broadcast. But at any rate, if, so this is evidence. Evidence that the agencies aren't the high standard bearers that they're supposed to be, I say, in proper application, is the ability you now have, the power you have to start to undermine the presumption, rebut the presumption of that trust that they don't deserve. Plants that eat the biggest selling weed killer in the world found in the Western Australia's far north. I don't know how to feel about this. Uh, plants that eat the biggest selling weed killer, uh, plants that are not killed by by uh, glyphosate, was a big deal. Uh, yeah, that's cool. But then I started to wonder, well, this is what they're doing with the genetically mod genetic modifications. I'm not sure what to say about this. Th there's plants already that are modifying themselves against man-made interference. But what does that mean ultimately when big money has the type of influence like they have over the FDA in order to get to utilize this finding now? The farmers can't, uh, they, they overuse glyphosate. Something that this story, if you read it, will be more evidence that it's, it is persistent, contrary to what the, the company Monsatan said it was to the FDA. More evidence that the, the, uh, the relationship with the government uh, and its duties is fallen and failed. More evidence, not a gripe, not a complaint, another evidence of how this works, that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're adversely affecting the environment they were supposed to check. And that's adversely affecting people and their production. As we start again and seeing quickly, gene-edited baby experiment may have created unintended mutations. I told you that, folks. Uh, now it's a story in The Guardian. I told you the CRISPR technology has been admitted to have unintended consequences. What's the question? Why is this a story? They're, they're finding all kinds of problems uh, w with this uh, uh, attached to the baby experiment. Uh, ethics got involved. They're finding violations. I said as soon as they got, ethics got involved, it was going to be a problem. You can't do this kind of gene editing. You can't do this kind of thing. The government's oversights are here, and they still do the science beyond. There's no check and balance. They're going to cause. They're causing trouble, not going to cause. And so it's up to us. We can step in where we can. Some some less concentrated, some less lesser issues, maybe like the COPPA. Uh, otherwise, this stuff gets wild and dangerous, and people start getting hurt. And then we just make complaints, and that's not going to make it. Not going to cut it. It's just not. Thank you for listening today, and Grimner for all you do at reallibertymedia.com. Jules over there at UCY, I think you have a problem with the website. I don't know. I think I saw you posting on Twitter. Uh, appreciate uh, if you don't know it, uh, uh, maybe to find out why it's glitching out uh, for the for the listeners there and everybody else, Sound Minds, and uh, thank you for what you do uh, simulcasting there. And I'll be with you next week. Tech tips or nature will.
Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass.